Mei! You see, no, I will. Welcome to Shoujo and Tell, where we discuss shoujo manga and tell who's hot and who's not, talk about themes, and just generally geek out. Today, October 1st, 2023, we'll be shoujo and telling about the series Juline by Narumi Kakinouji. I should have practiced that before, but I got, I got it pretty good. Okay. <laughs> Woo! Woo! Japanese. Okay. I'm your host, Ashley McDonald, and I'm joined by Megan DeYarman. Hello, Megan. Hello. I'm glad to be here. It's been a while. I think we determined it's like been five years since I was last on the podcast. I know. I was like, wait, was did we? I thought I was like, I know we did Key of the Kingdom. Is that yeah. the only thing we've done? No, we also talked about the full time wife escapist. Oh yes, I was like, no, there was something else. <laughs> okay, yes, thank you. That's so good. How did I forget that one? Okay, I don't know how I forgot that one, but so yes, yeah, so Megan, a lot of. A lot of stuff has happened. We don't have to talk about that, though. Who are you for the people who might not have uh, listened to either of those aforementioned episodes? Uh, In that case, uh, my name is Megan. I am a longtime manga blogger. I've been running my manga review blog, the Manga Test Drive, for over 11 years now. I also have a side blog called Renaissance Jose, where I do longer form reviews and essays and whatnot. Uh, I'm an occasional... Appearances at Anifem. I occasionally do convention panels, uh, most recently at this year's Anime Lockdown. And I am a shoujo manga enthusiast, which is why I'm here. Yeah, and I feel like you always bring me these ones that I've never even heard of, <laughs> which I love. In the, that's like the best way. <laughs> I mean, that's part of what I do at the manga test drive. I, you know, I dig up a lot of stuff that people have forgotten about and talk about it. Yeah, if you search Juline manga on Google, you're like the first hit. So you you have uh, the SEO Woo! magic on this manga. <laughs> I'll take it. You'll take it. Okay. All right. So this first 10 minutes or so is going to be spoiler free about Juline. And then we're going to I'll give a spoiler warning for when we just go tell you the ending. Okay. So Megan, what what is Juline about? So... Jilin is the story of three ninja clans, each of which who bear a unique fighting style and each possesses a mystical elemental treasure. And the focus is on the titular Jilin, who is the only child and heir of the Ganga clan, who specialize in blade work and air-based attacks. One day, she and the other ninja families are threatened by the mysterious Black Pearl clan, whose equally mysterious leader seeks to capture the family's treasures and destroy all of the clans by using their own missing menfolk against them. So it's ultimately up to Juline to team up with the daughters of the other ninja clans to take back their treasures, save their loved ones, and stop the Black Pearl clan for good. Yeah, th- as much as this has a plot, yes, that's what it is. Because <laughs> uh, I was definitely like, is this going places? Why are we at school? What is the world? Like... I have so many questions. <laughs> it takes a while, but it gets there. It gets there. It settled down. You know, there were some extraneous characters that I was like, that guy wasn't important. Like that, that's fine. We don't we don't need him. Uh that's cool. Yeah. So Megan, how did you hear about this series? I didn't know about the series until I reviewed it on the manga test drive in 2017. And if you look at my review for it, it's it's generally pretty positive, and I enough so that I actually hunted down all five volumes of the manga, and I've hung on to them ever since because it's just a, such an interesting little series, and even today, still very unique. Yeah, it's very '90s again in the best way. I mean that <laughs> as a compliment. I love the '90s. Uh, like at some points, I'm like, okay, Bakuya. One of the one of the princesses. I'm like, that's just jury from Utna, you know. <laughs> like, I get, like, the way this is drawn is just like some Utna vibes are going on, and throw in some Sailor Moon, you know. Like that, that's what I get out of this. I had never heard of this until you were like, "Hey, you want to do this on the podcast?" And I was like, "Ninjas? I like ninjas. Yes, but like, yeah. What made you like pick it up when you just saw it and you were like, yeah, I'll buy buy this old Tokyo Pop comic." <laughs> A lot of it had to do with its creator, Narumi Kakanoichi, because she's had a fascinating life. She is 
extremely well known, just not necessarily from manga. Uh, first of all, it's not her first career. She started out as an animator, and she's been working in anime since 1980. Uh, you can find animation credits for her going all the way back to Space Runaway Ideon, on the original Dr. Slump, the original Earth Yatsura, Macross, uh, including both the TV show and the movie Do You Remember Love, uh, the Ixer OVAs, the original Megazone 23. She worked a lot through the 80s and 90s. And she kind of kind of went on a hiatus for a while as far as animation went. And But she actually had something of a career comeback in the mid-2010s where she started working again as a key animator and animation director on stuff like uh, The Pilot's Love Song, Aldenoa Zero, and Loop on the Thirds uh, parts four through six, just to name a few. Aldenoa Zero! <laughs> that doesn't you remember Aldenoa Zero? I do remember Aldenoa Zero. <laughs> yeah, because... Boy, people tried to make that a thing in like 2015. Oh, yeah, we tried really hard to make that a thing. <laughs> and that didn't quite work. Another thing is she herself is married to an animator uh, turned director, a guy who's at different points in his career has gone by Toshiki or Tosh Toshihiro Hirano. Back in the day, he was known for directing like a lot of gritty OVAs. Uh, he worked on some of the later Ixer OVAs, uh, Apocalypse Zero. Uh, these days, he's directing the Baki anime for Netflix. And of, of course, around here, he's known for that grittiest of shoujo anime, Magic Knight Ray Earth. Oh, man. <laughs> but by herself and in collaboration with her husband, she's actually made a fair bit of manga. Uh, most of it short ho uh, shoujo horror stories. But if she's known for anything outside of this one, it's for the creating Vampire Princess Mew, which was very much a thing among uh, shoujo anime and manga fans in the 90s and even to some degree into the early aughts. And not only did they collaborate together on the manga and its its various sequels and spin-offs, but also its anime adaptations because they did a OVA adaptation in the late 80s and there was a TV show in 1997. Uh, she also works as an illustrator, uh, most notably on... Uh, uh, Yoshiki Tanaka's supernatural mystery series, Ryoko's Case File, which I believe got, also got an anime in 2015, somewhere thereabouts. Mm. So yeah, she's a busy lady. She's a busy lady. I'm so sad. I've never like read or watched Vampire Princess Miyu. Admittedly, it's kind of tricky these days. Uh, Studio Iron Cat put out at least the first two Vampire Princess Miyu manga, but they've been out of print since they went out of business in like 2004. Animago released the OVA, but again, that's long out of print. I, they did get a DVD release because I own it, but also probably been out of print for the better part of 20 years. Uh, same goes for the TV show. I think that was last released by Sentai. So yeah, I mean, if, if you're an old school uh, shoujo anime fan, you've probably heard of it, but I don't blame anybody who's gotten into this in the last 20, 15 years not being familiar with it. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm like, I guess I've heard of it, but yeah, I, I was never into it. And like, Macross is something that I've been like, I need to watch that and just have not. Every, every two years, I'm like, need to watch Macross. No, such a mess. Me. Okay, so do you feel like, I guess we can talk about the art, like, does her being an animator influence like the story and the art and how it goes? Oh, absolutely. You can tell this woman has done a lot of live studies. She has a really solid idea of how bodies move, and that plays a lot uh, into how she draws action. Also, uh, in the back of most of these volumes, there's like, there's basically sete sheets, like little character sheets where she, you know, draws the models for each character and like different facial expressions and movements to, to make sure they stay on model, which is much more an animator thing than a mangaka thing. Oh, interesting. I didn't really think about that. I was just like, these are cool. Yeah, so like, what's your favorite aspect of the series overall? I I think it's really just the novelty of it all. Like, you, other people, including yourself, have talked about how shoujo is not just high school romance. It is a multitude of genres under one umbrella. But one of the rarest forms of shoujo is shoujo action stories. And also, it's 
a decent ninja manga, and you'd be shocked at how rare that is. Just as much then, because this came out like a year in Japan, uh, a year before Naruto started. I was about to say, are you telling me Naruto is not peak ninja manga? I'm afraid I must shock you, but no, not quite. Oh my gosh. (laughs) But even then, there's like maybe one or two other shoujo manga I can think of that feature ninjas. And and doubly so for being a relatively modern day ninja story, because there's a lot of ninja ninja fiction in Japan, but most of it is historical. And while there are lady ninjas or kunoichi as they were known present, usually it's more as like a fan service sort of thing versus being mm-hmm. the focus of the story. But it's also kind of unique just because it's one of the few kakunoichi works that isn't a horror story, and it's one of the few that's made it over into English. Yeah, yeah. No, for sure. No, when I think ninja shoujo i'm just like well there's that time in maid sama where they made the butler guy or whoever dress up as a ninja and just say nin nin that's what comes to mind for me See, i occasionally think of things like tail it's like tail to the moon i think shoujo b put that out in the aughts it's by the same mangaka who did stepping on roses i read through a little bit of that meh meh no, but yeah, th- in this they have phones, and I think I was thrown off by that. They like mentioned, like, I'm going to go call, you know, like Kyo or something. And I was like, wait, but you're ninjas. You can't have phones. Like, that's not allowed. Yeah. Like, there's ninja dojos and there's training and whatnot, but, you know, they also go to school. And they have relatives who have Chinese restaurants and that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're just wearing a normal high school uniform, you know? I was like, okay, strange. I think you mentioned this in the, in your review, though. It's definitely just running on, like, vibes, though, <laughs> for the most part. We'll get into that. Yes. Um, but no, I agree. Like, a lot of this is just very flowy action shots. And I'm like, oh, yeah, this is not normally what you get in the shoujos. Like, when there's all this blank space or, like, space without text, it's usually, like, we're going to linger on that kiss you know (laughs) or or whatever but in this it's like i'm gonna linger on julian kicking this guy in the face and i'm like cool i like that (laughs) (laughs) as as already mentioned or perhaps we didn't overtly mention this but so julian is a bit out of print (laughs) because oh just a touch or just a tad bit yes uh it was originally published only published by Tokyo Pop in a flipped format, so that's that's always fun. Yeah, this would have been the last ones they released in full in the flipped format. Like they started publishing this at the beginning of two thousand one, yeah, and finished it up around the end of two thousand two. Which by that point they had already launched their one hundred percent authentic manga initiative. Wow. Yes, yes, yes. No, for sure. And I noticed like my volume one, it says it's from Chicks Comics, but then from there on out, it's it's Tokyo Pop, and I was like, okay. Yeah, Chicks Comics was a short-lived imprint they did in, like, the days when they were mixed comics that kind of distinguished their shoujo releases from their non-shoujo releases. It it seemed to be a rather inconsistent thing. Oh, Tokyo Pop is inconsistent? I know, the devil, you say. (sighs) That's that's wild to me. Um, It does appear that, you know, online you can buy it for not horribly expensive. If you really want to read it, you can pay like cover price or less from what, what I've seen. Yeah, this is not like a hugely rare or in-demand manga. So yeah, it's, it's definitely not an expensive one. Um, I should also note that this was actually serialized back in the day. Back when, you know, shoujo back, like uh, actually more actually manga magazines were a thing here. Mm. Because this was serialized in Smile, which was uh, Tokyo Pop's sp- a shoujo themed spin-off magazine from the original mix slash Tokyo pop magazine. And that ran from 2000 to the, mo- the magazine's cancellation in 2002. Yes. I didn't even know Tokyo pop had a shoujo magazine. I'm learning so much today. And also I'm glad here you, you mentioned like the lettering is bad. Oh, oh yeah. We'll, we'll get into it. Uh, <laughs> This is a very awkward era for Tokyo Pop as far as actually assembling their books. Notably, they were, from what I could find on ANN, they were supposed to re release this in like uh, an unflipped, standardized uh, size release around 2006. 
but this was the point where uh, Kadansha, who originally published this in Japan, was starting to pull licenses from Tokyo Pop, as this is the point where they're setting up Del Rey. Right. Mm-hmm. So that release never happened. But Tokyo Pop did actually publish its sequel series called Shaolin Sisters. Oh, Shaolin Sisters is like overtly a sequel series? Yeah, it, it's about Julene. Uh, they localize as Julin there. And I have not looked it up. I need to check if they actually finish that. You can't guarantee that with later Tokyo Pop books. Yeah. But yeah, if you're curious to read more, it's out there. Oh my gosh, this is such a, a cycle of old school Tokyo Pop nonsense. <laughs> 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 my brain is like breaking right now. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, yes. Yeah, so I assume that it's like the volumes maybe are kind of rare, but yeah, it's not hotly in demand. So like the price is still good. <laughs> That's how I assume this is going. But what do I know? I clearly don't know anything. All right. So if you want to go by Julian, because we've intrigued you so much about ninjas, pause here and go do that and then come back after you've read it. If you've already read Julian or you just don't care about spoilers, here's the spoiler warning. We're going to spoil all the stuff now. We're going to talk about other characters and stuff (laughs) and what happens at the end. Oh, my gosh. Okay, here we go. So I think we should establish our core group of characters because, as I said, there were some characters introduced who just like like their grandfather or uh, Kyo's dad. Yeah, where I was just like, you didn't need to tell me about them at all. Like they didn't add anything, (laughs) But, but that's okay. So we've got our core group here. On the on the on the good people side, I would say is Julian, Kyo, Bakuya, and Seika. So, how much do you love Julian? Julian, like she's in very very much a shoujo heroine in like the stereotypical sense. Like she's spunky, she's romantic, she's not you know the the, the biggest thinker. She she yeah. tends to be kind of impulsive. You know, act first, think later. She's also just very much a teenager in that sense. Just, you know, not a thought in her head, crushing on the older dude in her life. Like, oh, no, we're totally going to get married. He's totally going to kiss me someday because you're 13 and you're dumb and you don't know better. <laughs> <laughs> yes, she has a crush. What is Ryoko? Is like Ryo- Ryoko is one of the, the students of her ninja clan, like one of the members. But and he was like a disciple and oh, friend yes. of her father's. So when Julian's dad disappeared because he he had a falling out with another member of his, who I think was his brother, who kind of split off and is like, I have to go study in the mountains so I can become more powerful. Her her dad disappeared and Ryoko more or less became Julian's guardian. Yes. He very much regards her. Thank goodness he, he entirely regards her like a little kid. Oh, yeah. He's totally like... Julene, I must take you to school and protect you. And oh my gosh, go to bed. <laughs> like, why are you in here with Kyo? You know? <laughs> and she's just like, oh my God, he cares for me. Yes, yes. Oh my gosh, this means he must love me forever. And it's like, no, no. He had a charge and he's he's a good guy and he's just trying his best to make this happen. And you're making his life really difficult unnecessarily, but that's okay. Uh, what do I, I like Julian, yeah, but she very much is a very, like, you know, also has that power dynamic of, like, oh, she needs help from Kyo all the time, but she actually could kick your butt, like, she's fine, we get to have it both ways, we get to have our cake and eat it too, in this manga is a lot of what happens here. Yeah, she she does get better throughout the the course of the series, she gets a, a little more serious and thoughtful. Uh, particularly when she's around the the other ninja princess girls, I love them all together. I gotta say, yes, <laughs> yes, their their friendship is very good, and I wish there were more moments about that. Let's let's talk about the princesses first, then. So, Bakia, how much do you love Bakia? Bakia is great. Uh, she, you you look at her and you think, oh, she's going to be like the Oja Sama here. You know, she's the one with. The fluffy blonde curly hair, not not full sausage curls, but it, no. there's definite fluff. Yeah, <laughs> and you know she's very prim and proper. She is the oldest of the group. It's kind of vague, but she's definitely like an older high school student student versus like Julene, who feels very much like freshman. 
Yes. <laughs> she feels like middle school. <laughs> she she is the student president of their school. And there's a running gag with uh, her and Seika, who are basically like the hall monitors. And we're always catching Julene and Keo as they just manage to make it into school after the, the gates close and therefore are late. Yes, and we must take their student ID and and not let them train in the gym. That That is their punishment. Okay, I gotta admit, I was like, okay, so Bakia and Seika, the third princess, are definitely gonna be a couple. Like, Seika's going so hardcore into this. And then it was like, Bakia has a true love that used to be a member of Seika's clan, but has, like, you know, loved Bakia so much that he defected to the jeweled mirror clan, which is her clan instead, and their love, and that he's the one who's gone off and she must go find him. And I was like, what? Are you kidding me? Look, you know, they're, they can be bisexual ninjas. That can be a thing. <laughs> that could be a thing. <laughs> and yes, so yeah, Bakia has this missing fiance, and it's all very tragic and romantic. And I, I won't deny that there's a certain like dramatic beauty in that, but yeah, I, I can also see where you're you're getting the major Yuri vibes between her and Seika because there's very much kind of like a mistress and her servant maid. Like there's yes. this running thing with Seika always fixing Bakia's hair ribbon because she always has a ribbon in her hair. Yes, like multiple times, and Seika, like I really wanted more story. Because, you know, again, it was, like, so intertwined. It's like, okay, Seika, like, this this guy that she crushes on, he changes his name to Gahaku when he joins the Jeweled Mirror Clan, but he, his original name was Yuki when he's in the, the water, what were they called? The Water Crest Clan or something? The Water Crystal Clan. Water Crystal Clan. I was like, I know it's a C. Okay, Water Crystal Clan. And so I was like, okay, like there's so much history here. I want to know so much more. This is like fan fiction fodder because you don't really get that much about it. It's just like, yep. Right. When, when the stuff with Julian and Keo starts to get a bit tedious, you're like, can we focus on them a little more for a while? There, there's clearly interesting stuff going on. And uh, also should be noted that, of course, Bakia is the heir to her own ninja clan. Uh, their power is over the earth. And she specifically uses like uh, strings, not not quite like garrote strings, but sort of like that for her fighting skill. Yeah, she will cut you with thread. She will trap you and chop off your head. No, she's a good girl. She's a good girl. Okay. So Seika. We also love Seika, obviously. We love Seika, even though her she is has the look that is absolutely the most nineties with her very severe <laughs> bob and her her workout gear, which includes like a sleeveless turtleneck style look. Yeah. <laughs> I'm definitely like, what's going on here? It's okay. You are definitely lesbian, so in the nineties. <laughs> so I, I guess I'll forgive you. <laughs> That's what I took away from it. <laughs> Uh, she also seems to be at or at least closer to Bakia in age than Juline. Uh, she is the heiress to the Water Crystal Clan, as noted. Uh, her weapon is, it appears, it's not clear if it's just a regular old bow staff or it's a chain staff where it can split and you can use it kind of like nunchucks. Definitely became nunchucks at one point, yeah. Or like she had nunchucks at one point. <laughs> her seems to be like the most physical, like, family fighting style and that's a lot more about you know mm. bouncing around and whatnot yeah and as i noted before like she's she's a little more servile to bakia not not in like in a humiliating sort of way but just like like a ruler and their follower yeah like definitely like bakia is student council president and i am her right hand person right like that's yes. that's that's the vibe they have for sure <laughs> I also really love her and so notably her opponent or like the person who the man who has left her that she is bereft about is her brother. Yes. I can't I'm trying to remember the sequence of events. It was like Julene's dad leaves, then the brother goes. No, is it that Gahaku goes to like find him? It, it all seems to happen around the same time that all of these men disappear from their families. But yeah, uh Sega had an older brother who picked on her a lot. 
Uh, he was the heir to the clan, but he also had uh, a weak, a bad eye, which was something of a weakness. So he's like, I have to go and get stronger. And he disappears. And we never hear from any of them again. And that's fine. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, well, to round out the crew of we're going to go kick Batty but you know, we do have Keo, who we've mentioned a couple of times, but he is the childhood friend of Juline and definitely not a love interest, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he starts out, frankly, as kind of a, a callow brat. Like, his first appearance, like, he's sparring with Juline in the practice hall and then pops up behind her and is like, ah, touched your butt. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, I forgot about that. No, he definitely did. Yeah, that was bad. <laughs> <laughs> and he's he's very clearly sweet on Julian from the start, and he's kind of jealous that all of her attention is on her guardian, Ryoko. But over time, he tries to be very chivalrous, like, no, I'll protect you, Julian, from, from this danger from the Black Pearl gang. And his arc is pretty much him learning not just to grow in his own power as a ninja, because, again, he's part of her clan, but he's not a direct relative. He might be like a cousin. It's a little unfair. Yeah, I was a little confused. But it's also him learning to kind of step aside and let Julian fight her own fights because, you know, she has a power of her own and she needs to do this as part of being the heir to her family. Yeah. Wh okay. That brings up, what did you make of this bird who has ah, the same name as Julian? Yes. She has a guardian bird, also named Julian, who is kind of like her her spirit animal of sorts. Like she can like see through its eyes at points through something something mystical ninja powers. Okay, I'm glad you also. I was like, is this literally a spirit animal? Like I think so. <laughs> something like like it's an actual physical bird, but you know, as as part of I guess her her ninja powers because they are air based. It's like she can kind of see through the bird's eyes and use that for, like, reconnaissance. And this comes up more than once. Oh, yeah. Yeah. At certain points, she gets, like, maybe mythical, maybe, like, actually manifested in the real world, wings and stuff, like human Julian, and you're like, okay, I mean, shoujo, this is what it's all about. Yes. I <laughs> mean, me shoujo more. and ninjas. You know, <laughs> ninjas have magical, mystical powers. Yes. I mean, the fact that they, they have, like, literal ninja treasures that are clearly meant to evoke, like, the, the famous imperial Japanese regalia. Uh, for mm -hmm. those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, uh, as part of the royal family, anytime there's a new emperor crowned, there are three, like, ancient objects that they have to kind of view and hold uh, before they are put on the throne. And it's uh, an ancient mirror, an ancient jewel, and an ancient sword. And no one outside of the, the Japanese royal family has been allowed to see this since they started doing this, like, over a thousand years ago. But it's uh, the idea of, you know, these three similar sorts of objects holding power is something that shows up time and again in anime, like uh, Sailor Moon, for example. What are the, the, the mystical objects that the outer senshi has? Uh, Uranus has her sword, Neptune has the mirror, and Pluto has the jewel in her staff. Right. Like, once you notice this sort of thing, you'll, you'll see it popping up over and over in all sorts of places, including this manga. Yeah, I was like, that also makes sense because I feel like, again, the manga just, it kind of started to set up like mythology of how the world works. And it's like, there are these clans, they live in this mountain. And you're like, okay, I get a sense that there's a greater world out there and they're supposed to be doing something cool. But I feel like it just uses, you know, all this Japanese lore as like shorthand of like, we don't have yeah. to go further than this. You know, yeah, and we, and we only really learn about Julian's artifact, the ivory sword. Like, we know about the water crystal and the uh, the jeweled mirror, but we don't really get an idea of what they can do, like as part of their powers. Yeah, no, and they don't appear to have animal companions. No, they didn't have animal companions that were mentioned. They should have. That's very Disney princess of them, you know? Like, come on. <laughs> I need I need animals. <laughs> okay. Well, so yes. So that is that is let's let's get on to our, our big baddie here, because 
There's a lot going on with this one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they have three names, first of all. So, so the Black Pearl's clan or whatever is ruled by Black Pearl, who also goes by Tamoyo, who also goes by May. Question mark, question mark, question mark, profit. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, God, she is a fascinating character because her whole idea is like I was abandoned and I was basically raised by spirits and therefore I, I want to transcend humanity beyond yes. age, beyond gender. I, I I want nothing but power and I'm going to break apart your families and your relationships to prove that this is doesn't matter, that in the end all they want is power. And there's a lot there's a lot of fuss, especially early on about uh her I guess everyday guys of Tamayo Black, where everyone's like, yes. "Oh, is it a girl? Is it a boy? We just don't know. We just don't know, and we definitely want to kiss it, you know, like <laughs> for sure." Oh yeah, <laughs> if anybody's bringing the Yuri vibes, even stronger than Baki and Se- Seika, it's absolutely Tamayo, yes. who, is, who is hitting on teenagers left and right, and just leaving everybody sexually confused in their wake. <laughs> yes. And I'm like, yes, do it. I love it. I love to see it. <laughs> but yeah, she also has this like childish alter ego called May, who was like this doll she made and this magical doll she made in, in her loneliness and her youth that it is kind of like an extension of her. Yeah, there was so much- at first I was like, oh, who could have guessed May and her are the same person. And then they like weren't actually. And I was like, oh, I'm salty. Well, they- <laughs> they made it a, a little obvious because uh, in all her forms, she has a mole near her eye. Yeah. And, and they focus on that a lot. So, yeah, you know, like a lot of villains of shoujo manga from this era, you know, she's got a very tragic backstory. She's kind of sexually ambiguous. She's, you know, seducing everybody left and right. At one point, she captures Kyo in this very weird, dreamy a sequence of just rolling around in all this cloth and incense, you know, clearly, yeah. you know, changing her, ge- changing to their gender presentation basically as needed. Yes. Whichever is going to suit best, like we'll do it, you know? And I, part of me wonders like, is this kind of offensive? I mean, part of it might just have to do with the, the, the translation. I'd be curious to see how mm-hmm. her gender is a- addressed, I guess, more directly in the original Japanese. I wonder if it, it's quite literally so much, oh, is this a boy or is it a girl? Oh, yeah. I guess I didn't think to question the like actual <laughs> translation that hard of of that, like what they're, they're saying for the gender there. Yeah, I mean, I think it's safe to say that so, some of these uh, notions about gender, it's not quite up in front, but it's definitely not a mo- it's not a modern take. Let's put it that way. No, but what I, what I liked about it though was that even though Tamiyo Black Pearl's gender is like ambiguous, they actually do usually present as female, but then people still question if it's male. And I feel like that's actually not usually what happens. It's like people dress in the more masculine clothes True. and then get uh, Tamayo binds like we see clearly like they they bind their chest in like yeah the fashion way yeah um and i remember having a discussion with somebody once where it's like why does gender neutral usually mean like you actually default to something that you know stereotypically is more masculine so i was like i kind of appreciate this this take on gender presentation being ambiguous but actually still skewing more feminine and, you know, there's also the fact that, you know, the villain is kind of ambiguously queer. So, like, that's yeah. an idea that doesn't necessarily hold up great for modern audiences. It, it kind of it is what it is, and you have to roll with it. But it was the time, but also she is truly just the, the most fascinating and magnificently evil character. So it, it's hard to begrudge them. Yeah, I mean, I love them. Like, go be you. <laughs> Black Pearl, Tamayo, May, do it, <laughs> you know? Um, so, so you know, this person trying to transcend humanity has, yes, captured the three men that we mentioned before. And it gets very confusing because they have two names as well <laughs> for each of them. Uh, well, I guess Gahaku Yuki Miyabi has three, too. Like, thanks. True. This is 
five volumes and I have to keep track of all these <laughs> names for the same person. Uh, too much for me. <laughs> but yes. Um, so yes, so all our princess girls have to go fight Sai, who is Seiju, who is Julian's dad. Uh, Miyabi is Gahaku Yuki. So that, and B- Bakuya, I'm going to like, I keep saying it wrong because I'm like, I you want to say flip- Yakuya like the, the no. character- <laughs> <laughs> I want to mix up all of those those yeah consonants like ah. oh my god okay too too hard um so yeah so Bakia her lover and then Shin who is Seishin that one's easier thank you for like seeding that better uh who is Seika's that's all connected Seika's brother and you know they have the thing where it's like every time they get in fights they seem like they're so powerful right and like evil but then they're fighting the person that they like love the most so deep down inside they haven't lost the person they they truly were you know yeah a lot of the early mystery is the girls encountering them in their roles as the guardians of the black pearl clan and they're like is this my respective missing loved one here and they confirm their way through yes it is and so they have to you know grapple with this grief that they've had try to to save this, the, uh, their respective loved one, if they can, you know, from this. And yeah, dramatically, this is kind of the, the big part of the manga. As as the Guardians of the Black Pearl, they're all kind of indistinctly evil and power hungry. But the more that they fight with their respective loved ones, the more that their memories start to peep through. And then they get confused. And then uh, the Black Pearl is like, no, you're still under my control. You must fight them. Yes, using so much drugs, so much incense to keep them under control. <laughs> Yay, drugs. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, drugs. Uh, yeah, no, for sure. I, I definitely was like, I guess I feel like because Tamiyo slash Black Pearl slash May is such a strong and like weirdly intriguing villain, that mystery like kind of paid off, even though it felt sort of somewhat obvious the whole time it's like yes in volume two you're like yes it is the people that you are looking for but possess somehow you know like yeah easy the drama is a little drag a uh, dragged out for a bit but i mean i'd be lying if i said if it wasn't good stuff that you know it wasn't effective particularly in julian's case because she's so much younger and is still kind of grappling with the, the loss for dad and the effect that's had not just on her immediate family but the ninja clan as a whole yeah okay i have a question about julian's dad like at certain points they started talking about how he's like he was mean in a way like she thought no, he no, was no, okay 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 it's that he got in a fight with his brother like his, his brother was a rebel he was he was starting stuff and eventually, the brother got kicked out of the ninja clan. But Seiju, T- uh, Julian's dad, yeah. felt really bad about it. Like, you know, causing strife within the family. And ultimately got to the point where, like, I, I need to get stronger. I have to, you know, go away, go on some sort of spiritual quest to kind of make up for this. So, yeah, that there was basically there was a lot of family drama before he left. And it- it's never quite been resolved. Okay. And, and similar things are, are going on with the other girls. Like, Bakia's dad didn't entirely approve of Yuki because yeah. he was from this different family and all that. So he's like, I have to go out and get more powerful so your dad will accept me as one of your clan and we can get married. Yeah. And, and Seishin is like, oh, I have to be get stronger than my sister so I can be a, a proper heir to my ninja clan. And I'm like, no, you don't. Just let her be the <laughs> She's cooler than you, okay? Just accept it. It's fine. I mean, this is something we'll get to when we get in more into the themes, because this, uh, this is this this is going to be a big part of it. Okay. Well, let's let's Harry there. No. Okay. So for what I had put like art corner, let's talk more about the art. What this gorgeous made just art so gorgeous, so good. What it made me think of, like, because you know, again, it's so fighty, and you know could compare that more to shonen i could it made me think a lot of clamp but it's like the antithesis of clamp clamp fights where all they do is like put incomprehensible speed lines and you have to stare at it for five minutes to be like what is 
even happening here? There were definitely points in this, to be clear, where I was like, what is happening here? But but <laughs> it's it, more that had to do with the paneling than like the drawing yeah. itself. Yeah, that was more like the absence of something between the panels, you know? Than- yeah, clan fights tend to be very busy, but Kakanoichi's approach to it is very light, relatively free form, at least for sh- uh, shoujo, and very flowy, just like the way she draws lines, the way she draws the movement of limbs and cloth and whatnot. Like it, yeah. it's very sparse. It's very elegant and very graceful, which is, you know, qualities you want when you're drawing a ninja fight. Yeah, for sure. I was definitely like, Oh, this, there would be like pages and pages where there's no dialogue at all. Which just again, make, not complaining, <laughs> not complaining. No, not complaining. I was just like, wow, this is, and again, not in a, like we're lingering, on a kiss and the aftermath of a kiss and blushies it was like no people are kicking each other in the face or trying to stab each other with with a sword you know like it was like okay i'm here for this i'm here and these are also the moments where her background in animation and her art training really shines like it's very clear she has a strong idea about how the the human body moves she has really good ideas about like posing and, and whatnot and she really conveys like just the power and the elegance of these fights without you know getting unrealistic or stopping for fan service or anything like that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It was it was so good. I was like taking pictures on my phone. I was like, this doesn't do it justice. <laughs> this doesn't this just reminds me that it's beautiful. But if I post it, like people won't understand as well that it is. But yes, so does Tokyo Pops lettering take away from the art though uh, it, it kind of does and, and admittedly you noted before that like there's not a, a there's more emphasis on the art versus the dialogue and looking through the, the volume i have of shaolin sisters and what i've seen of vampire princess mew this seems to be a constant with narumi kakuinichi like her characters are just not known for being particularly wordy mm-hmm. But yeah, this is comes from a, a very awkward phase of Tokyo Pop's transition. The most of it comes down to the lettering. I swear to God, if they're not using Times Rome Times New Roman for the font, it's something very similar. It looks and bad. <laughs> it looks bad. It looks like a scanlation. And occasionally there are typos. But also the font is just literally too big. And so because of that, they kind of have to dumb down the translation even more. Mm. I believe my original view, I've referred to it as just kind of blunt force trauma of translation. They also break up like the phrases within the text boxes in random places. And you're like, this is yeah. so hard to read. It's very amateur stuff. And uh, I actually found an online archive where someone had scanned a bunch of issues of Smile, mostly because uh, it, it was where Tokyo Pop was serializing Sailor Moon for a while. Mm -hmm. And if you look in there, the lettering is precisely the same as it is in these books. Like it it was always like that. And I I've seen worst from Tokyo Pop's books from a similar era. If you don't believe me, I'll hunt down the Gundam wing manga they published. That, that just looks awful. (laughs) Like that, that is just ridiculous. But yeah. Also notably, something that struck me, this is one of the few times I've ever seen a Tokyo pop book where they uh, translated the sound effects. Yeah. Okay. What stands out to me about that is that they actually put effort into, like, it's not amazing because it's Tokyo pop and early days of like lettering still, but like they put effort into making those things not look absolutely atrocious And, like, next to the font, it looks so even sillier. Yeah, like, I'm not crazy for the font choices they used for that. But this sort of retouching was much more common in the late 90s, early 2000s. And it's something that Tokyopop would completely abandon after their transition to unflipped manga. So that's, that's also something that struck out to me. Yeah. I mean, what stuck out to me is that, and I I was like, I don't know if in the past this was just standard, but like there's actually no listed letter. <laughs> no, I, I think that was usually considered part of the, like, the touch up. Graphic design or something? Could, yeah, it could be graphic design as well. Okay. I was like, well, there's where the error is. 
that's there's your problem. There's the problem. There is no letterer. We we need one of those. <laughs> we need or to they focus. need to make better choices. Yes. Alternatively, just don't use this font. Oh my god, it was terrible. I it, it was very hard to read. And such a shame next to like, yeah, the very beautiful, like light art that's happening all around it. I'm like, oh God, who approved this? <sighs> what was Stu Levy. Like, yeah, I was like, Stu Levy. <laughs> Don't answer. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> we don't talk about that guy. No. <laughs> so let's uh talk a little bit more about, yeah, the themes that were presented here where uh, we brought up this one already but just like transcending age gender and humanity and like making up for the lack of those things but like it came from the desire to fill in that gap with something entirely different but also was it in something entirely different because may was like i didn't have a dad so i like stole your dad <laughs> i was like okay yeah like th- that's kind of the foundation upon which most of the, the drama of Julian is built upon that the men in their life felt like they had something lacking that they had to make up for. And they had to, to look outside of themselves to make up for it. Like, I feel like there's some sort of commentary on masculinity here that I'm not entirely equipped yes. to articulate. Whereas with Julian and Bakia and Seika, they're the ones who ultimately have to reach within themselves to find the power to overcome this, overcome this struggle, you know, overcome the people that they loved and they missed and realize, you know, I I can't necessarily bring you back. I can't necessarily save you. So I have to fix this on my own. But also like the age gap, like they they are kind of the the younger generation kind of making up for the mistakes of their elders. Yes, for sure. That, that is also there. And yeah, I mean, in the end, I guess Julian is the only one who doesn't end up getting her her dad back. Like Gahaku slash Yuki comes back, Seishin comes back and then leaves again. <laughs> he didn't yeah. learn his lesson. No, no, that's the thing. They did learn the lesson. Like, yeah, I was weak. I that that was why I ultimately came to this. So I, yeah. I basically he's he's turning over. Uh, his status as heir to the clan officially to Seika. Mm. And the same with Bakia and Yuki. She literally was like, I- I'm glad I'm back. I'm glad I was able to save you. And even though I missed you so much, I- I've gotten to the point where I have to move on from this relationship. Like, I'll always love you, but I can't love you anymore. And it's ultimately Julene who was unable to save her dad. Like, she was close, but then Tamiyo got in there with you know, a sword and literally stabbed him to death for failing. Yeah. Casual, just like she did with R- Ryoku. Ryoku, yes, that guy. With, yeah, with Ryoko and uh, with the uh, the other uh, Kenga hanger-on that Kiyo ends up fighting with. Like, oh, yeah. Hara? 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 Hara. Yeah. That's it. There it is. But yeah, uh, and we learn as we get into Seika's, uh, Seijin's backstory, like he went off and he encountered Tamiyo and they fought and he lost his hands in the process. Yes. And she's like, oh, you've lost your power. But I can give it back to you. I can give you even better hands. <laughs> give you even better hands. Weird and creepy, but thank you, you know? <laughs> like, okay. And, and I feel like this almost feeds into a sort of like girl power vibe in like that late 90s Spice Girls sort of sense. Like, you know, the, the, yes. the men are ultimately weak because of their, they feel this need to reaffirm their power, but the girls have always had it within them. They just need to reach within themselves to find it and nurture it to save themselves and others. Yeah, no, and I love that. And I think that goes with like talking about the hands, the best moments to me that they're definitely no gay vibes, no, (laughs) (laughs) no homo here. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? Like, the three of them at one point go there. They slept horribly because they've, you know, like lost to the black pearls and they're like, Oh my gosh, we now definitely know that these guys are some weird versions of the men that we've lost and like yada, yada, yada. So they all sleep poorly. They go to school. And then at school, Julian is like, what if we just 
took a nap together <laughs> in the forest. I love that moment. That's one of my favorite moments I in know. the whole manga. No, for like, sure. <laughs> they all mutually recognize that they're stressed out over this and they haven't been sleeping. So Juline's like, just what if we cut class and we take a nap together in the woods together? We'll be safe. They like hold hands. They hold hands. It is incredibly <laughs> sweet. And yeah, more than a little homoerotic. And they actually do something similar again towards the end, you know, once the, the final battle is over. Yes, yes, they keep bringing it back. Uh, there were there were multiple panels with just the three of them being like, you know, magical girl transformations, basically, like in the midst of that, where I was like, yes, 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 for sure. This, this is everything I am about. But yeah, no, there's definitely like the power of hand-holding for rejuvenation and you know seiju loses both of his hands and i'm like yikes yes yeah hand holding as like a reaffirmation of relationships and connections between people yeah because at the end kyo too you know when julian finally notices him because ryoku's dead dark but okay and kyo has been such a good boy like they start holding hands and like doing the thing more and i'm like yes this is very cute i like this and yes well but there is plenty of heterosexual romance because this is a 90 shoujo manga there are some strong yuri vibes all over the place so here. many yuri vi- vibes yes yes i mean we've already mentioned the vibes going on between bakia and seika with the, like all the attention on the hair ribbons and just the for the fact they they interact more personally on a regular basis yeah and of course, Tamiyo just being a, an evil, possibly predatory <laughs> lesbian, question mark, all over the place. Yeah. I mean, Tamiyo definitely did, you know, a dirty when she went up to Kyo and was like, I'm going to make it look like I'm kissing you to hurry this hetero romance along and i'm like this is a strange strategy but okay yes but it also should be noted that julene is very very flustered by tamayo like at all yes. points like it, it it gave me big vibes of like usagi yes. and Miyako being yes. <laughs> all blushy crushy over uh sailor uranus sailor moon yes that it is exactly that <laughs> like i have a clear idea of your gender and orientation but I'm still feeling it. Yes. Oh my gosh, exactly. It is it's and, 100%. And I, I, I will confess, even as, as a straight cis woman, nah, I get it. I feel it. Yeah, I'm like, I I understand. Hun, hundy P. <laughs> this is all there. And yeah, I'm like, like I, I knew it wouldn't actually be Yuri... Or like gay in any way, because as you said, it's just like a thing that they do in the '90s. But then it all has to be hetero. But I was like, "Come on, come on!" I want to believe. We'll always have the fan fiction. We'll always have, which totally fan. doesn't exist for the series. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but well, we have to go make it on uh, archive of our own. We have to go make. There you go. Page and start making all the tags, add all the characters. I don't know how you start an archive. Of we we got to get the modern Yuri fans into this. That They'll do yes. it for us. Yes. Oh, my gosh. We're going to do it. We're going to start a little moment. Okay. So to end here with the ships that are hetero, because question mark, question mark, question mark. But so, you know, we, we've mentioned them all before. We don't have to, like, linger too long on them. But how did you feel about, like, Julian crushing on Ryoku. Awkward. Like, Awkward. It, it, it's very much a thing that teenage, teenage girls do. I mean, I know I, I was there. I was a hetero teen girl once myself. But it never stopped being so awkward. And only the reassurance that he was absolutely holding her at the proper distance as a guardian reassured any fears I might have. Do you think he understood that she had a crush on him? No. Uh, maybe, but not. He didn't understand just to how much of a degree she was crushing on him. Because it was bad. Yeah, because I was like, I feel like he might have um, second guessed his choice to like kiss her on the forehead and promise kisses if he like fully understood the gravity that was happening here. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but then he got dead, so. 
He got real dead. He got real Rip dead. Ryoku. It's okay. He was a good guy. He didn't deserve that. He didn't deserve that, but he had to go. He had to go so that we could make room for Keo and Julie. <laughs> Again, they're perfectly nice kids. Once they grow up a little, I'm sure they'll make a fine couple. It's just early on, they're kind of obnoxious. <laughs> And again, in a very yeah. teenage way, because, you know, she's crushing on this older dude. He's clearly crushing on her, but he's expressing it in this very bratty way because, you know, he's a teen boy and he's completely emotionally constipated and he doesn't know how to communicate his feelings clearly. <laughs> yes, yes, for sure. And he's like, she doesn't notice me. She's so silly. You know, <laughs> I did think that by the end they were like pretty smooth, though, like Kyo was like here i'll give you an advanced reward for going off to fight and i was like that's smooth <laughs> less smooth is the weird little epilogue or oh, at yeah. school and he gets the what? call out and it turns out to be from uh, like his younger brother or cousin who is like literally an elementary school age child yeah who is calling him out because i'm going to marry julian because of course he's he's a little boy and he doesn't understand what being married even is <laughs> yeah yeah and julian is a cute girl like of course of course he's he a thinks cute girl that. who is nice to him yes that's all you need to be married when you're a little kid right right yes yes a hundred percent um yeah no that epilogue was weird <laughs> Oh, all around. Especially since they introduced someone who might also be in an, another incarnation of Tamio, maybe, kind of, sort of, question mark. Maybe ostensibly a little more masculine? Yes, the masculine version. Is that part of the gender commentary too? Like, okay, this man finally, all the men finally found themselves by not getting all up in their heads, you know? I don't know, it's kind of last minute. I, I don't know if cock Akakanoichi was entirely thinking about it. No, they were just there for jokes. and they, But they weren't good jokes. Like <laughs> Mostly just, let, you know, just dudes harassing the girls at the end of the story. Yeah, and then what? they beat them up with their ninja powers. And it's just like, because now they have girl power. Girl power. And I was like, I didn't need this. I, I just didn't need it. No, for sure. Um, but yeah, no, I, I support Kyo and Julian. Like, they're cute. Yeah, what did you think of Bakuya and Gahaku? Because I feel like that was so mature for how not mature they actually are. I mean, like I said, there's a certain appeal in how romantically tragic it is, but it's kind of underbaked that we don't learn enough about them and their relationship beyond like their initial meeting when she was a little girl to get any sense of who they were as a couple. Yeah. And we're just, like, told that he was actually a gentle soul and not so good at fighting. And so he probably just shouldn't have, you know, tried to be a good fighter <laughs> was, like, the lesson there. And I was like, okay. Again, I really wanted to know more about them, though, because he had, like, defected clans or whatever. I was like, I want to know more. Tell Also, tell me more about this world. Like, does defecting clans matter? You all go to school together, you're besties, and then you're like... This Black Pearl clan isn't cool, though. They don't have a Japanese imperial object, you know? <laughs> like, come on. I want to know more. And so, in conclusion, the one true pairing is Bakuya and Seika. <laughs> Agreed. 100%. I mean, if we're going with, with canon ships, I guess it has to be Kyo and Juline, but like, the one, the, the real OTP is absolutely Bakuya Seika. Yes. We are aligned. Well, I think we've done this strange little ninja manga. Are there any final thoughts you want to leave the people with? I don't know if there's much to say other than I think Julene is a, a work worth revisiting. Uh, if you can find it by whatever means necessary, you know, read it, enjoy it, and check out more of Kakanoichi's work. Do you think there's a chance that it will ever be rescued, relicensed? No. No. Kadansha doesn't dig that deep. Maybe somebody might do it for Vampire Princess Mew because people actually remember Vampire Princess Mew, but not for this. That's true. That's true. Okay, that's fair. We just have to have it on the record, you know, for prove out, you know, 20 years from now, <laughs> which way this goes. Okay. Well, everyone, thanks for listening to Shoujo and Tell. 
comments, questions, constructive criticism, concerns, want me to stop saying C words, need to gush about how much you liked the vibes and atmosphere of this manga, email shoujo and tell at gmail.com or leave a comment on the episode's YouTube page. We're at shoujo and tell on, I should have changed this, blue sky and Instagram, trying to like list the ones I'd like, and Tumblr. Sure. I'm not going to say the thing that was formerly Twitter because it's the letter you don't pronounce in Japanese titles. Okay. <laughs> Megan, where can people find you and your work on the internet? Well, I'm ostensibly still on the site formerly known as Twitter, but I'm more <laughs> active uh, on Blue Sky at Brainchild129. Uh, it's also where I... I post all my reviews now under Manga Test Drive, also on Blue Sky. If you don't want to go to social media, you can visit the sites directly at mangatestdrive.blogspot.com or, or renaissancejose.blogspot.com. And if you like what I do here or elsewhere, not that you'd like to give me money for it on the regular, you can do so on Patreon under Megan D. Yes, everybody defect to Blue Sky. That's what we're saying. <laughs> Are you excited every time you see a new episode from us? If so, please consider leaving a rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you can leave ratings for stuff these days. I don't even know. The world, the internet has become a landscape of the wild, wild west. We no longer know what's happening here. But reviews, this will help the podcast reach more hearts or at least ears. You know what? Go on Blue Sky and say how much you love me. That's probably <laughs> also an effective method. Anyway. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back next time for... I I don't know. I have some desires, but I don't... I have not asked anybody to guest for those desires yet, so I cannot say that they will come true. But don't you worry. Don't you worry about it. There's still so much shoujo to tell. That doesn't make any sense. It's fine. Stay tuned. Until next time. Bye. Bye.